So ladies and gentlemen, welcome and uh, take a seat because we're going to have a panel discussion now. And joining us is uh, Robert von Otterwijk. Was that correct? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course we have Hillian and Selina. You've seen them uh, earlier. And Jonathan Bloom and Stefan Glim from Düsseldorf, Germany. So uh, we have a couple of questions for you. And the uh, uh, subject today is food waste prevention versus symptom treatment. And uh, my first question is uh, for you, Selina, and it is, what could be the world's first think tank against food waste first assignment? Well, that's a good question because uh, we are right now working to establishing a food waste think tank. I would say um, it could be implementing some of the good examples that we already have. For example, in Denmark, uh, as I sh showed earlier on, we have a co-op Denmark at the moment who are making uh, chips out of bread that is expired but is still good. So they fry it, they slice it, and they make small chips that they sell it. This is a business case that prevents food waste, makes growth for the industry. Uh, a case like that could be interesting to be replicated in let's say China or Russia or, well maybe not Russia, the Russian food right now is not a good situation. But anyway, China or Brazil or India. So, I mean, uh, the business case scenario is very good. So I think we have to concentrate on, you know, the food waste prevention and, and the new green growth. Mm. So that could be the first assignment. Yep. And for people watching this on the internet, uh, could you just introduce yourself uh, uh, for a few seconds? Yes, I'm, I'm Selena Yu, the founder of Stop Wasting Food Denmark and a blogger on food waste at the Huffington Post. Mm. Thank you very much. Actually, I have another question for you, Selina, and uh, it is uh, what to do when, fight, when the fight against food waste turns into greenwashing? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned the Intermarché supermarket in France. Uh, it was a big, 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 big campaign. I mean, everybody's seen the ugly fu fruits and vegetables in Intermarché supermarket in France. What I just heard, the campaign is only lasted for like 10 days and people are not buying into it so they still sell the perfect produce and they still have the perfect uh, fruits and vegetables and people still waste food. Uh, so I think this question could be directed at Jonathan. What do you think? I mean, if they make a lot of buzz about it but we found out that they're not really doing it, uh, what to do? Uh, it's on. Um, okay. Yeah, it's good. on. It's so, Selena, thanks for throwing it my way. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so, certainly, we don't want to have any kind of greenwashing, but from my perspective, that's better than, than nothing. So, I, I will take that activism as, as something to build upon, and hopefully, the popularity and, and the reach of that campaign by one retailer will, will lead to other versions in different countries or even continents, and hopefully that kind of activism will, will take root. But certainly we don't want to see companies in the food industry simply paying lip service to reducing food waste without, without actually making lasting changes. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, so just a few words, uh, and if you want to say something about yourself and what you do. Sure. Uh, my, my name is Jonathan Bloom. I'm the author of American Wasteland and the creator of WastedFood.com. And I consult and give talks on the food waste issue. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment on that question? Okay, moving on. So this uh, next question is uh, directed to Stefan uh, and or Jonathan uh, or Robert. So you can just uh, choose which one who wants to take this question. And uh, the question is how to continue the fight against food waste when the food waste is not on top of media's and consumers' agenda anymore? Who wants to take that question? I mean, I can start and I think that we, my evaluation is just the other way around. We are seeing a hype of getting, uh, getting um, safe food and food waste reduction uh, in all kind of media, even in politics. Um, if I compare it to 10 years ago, where we tried to explain the same advantages and the same solutions, and what we um, have today, it, it has considerably changed. If you talk to politicians, even in legislation, they start to think that the reduction of the food waste is first priority. Yeah? So um, I think we, 
we are far, far away um, that this subject um, is, is going out of the headlines. And um, some examples just mentioned will make sure that we stay in the headlines. But I think what is really important is, yes, it's a very emotional subject, but the messages which we are going out must be fundamental. And we are not sh should not follow just myths which are easy to communicate. We should really look what are the benefits and the reliable solutions to turn it around. Jonathan? Yeah, um, I recognize that it's a, a crowded marketplace of ideas in the food industry at large. So we get all these messages on, on what kinds of foods we should buy, where we should buy them. And I recognize that it's difficult. It's often confusing how to act. But in my view, reducing food waste, just simply trying not to waste food is fundamental. And I think most people have a, a visceral response to seeing food being thrown away. And it's really just a question of getting people to see that food waste and they will find those solutions for themselves. If people need a little bit of a, a helping hand on recognizing the importance of the issue, I think pointing out the environmental impact is, is certainly useful. The ethical one, in terms of the juxtaposition of hunger and waste, that will, will certainly get people's attention. But unfortunately, what gets people's attention the most is wasted money. So we all are, are rational economic thinkers, and so correlating the, the sheer financial loss with the food waste, I think, is what really motivates people to change. Mm. Just want to say also that the former speaker is uh, Stefan Lim from EAFA and FPE. Just so we have that sorted out. Thank you. Robert, a few words from FEA. FAO. Oh, FAO, sorry. My name is Robert van Otterdijk <laughs> from the Food and Agriculture Organization. And I'm working on the program called the Global Initiative on Food Loss and Waste Reduction, otherwise called Safe Food. Now on the question uh, what, what is going to happen uh, when it is not on the, on the top of the, of the political and other agendas anymore. Well, we uh, tackle the issue of food loss and waste for, uh, on four levels. Awareness raising uh, is only one of them. It's an important one, but it's only one of them. The other three are uh, establishing collaboration and partnerships. The third one is to do research to what are the best solutions to reduce food loss and wa food waste. And the fourth one is to implement these solutions mm. and to hand them over to the private sector and the food supply chain actors in order to implement them. Now, and that, that is what is going to happen if the uh, the interest, the media interest of food waste uh, reduces. By that time, uh, we have developed certain solutions and we have to make sure that these solutions um, are of economic benefit of everybody who implements them. Then you don't need any um, campaigning anymore to convince people to, to do it. If consumers throw away good food, they throw away money directly. Mm. Uh, it is very simple to indicate that and we have together with our partners developed a kind of guidance in order to um, give consumers a certain uh, uh, yeah, a guideline on how to reduce their own uh, food waste and we can calculate for them how much money they will save by, by doing so and the same is valid for the, the retail and the, the food manufacturing industry. They will simply uh, be more economic, more efficient and save money if they reduce the losses and waste. And that is what we have to uh, focus our attention on. Then we can do without uh, excessive campaigning. Selina Jul. And I also think that there are some certain stories in the media that will never go away. I mean, the food waste seasons, like Christmas and Easter, I mean, we've been in the media for the last seven years, and it's amazing because we like in Reuters, the Danish Ritzau all the time. And especially in Christmas, especially in Easter, we sometimes repeat those stories again and again and again. And I know that repeatment sometimes does um, help the understanding, but sometimes we need to go out there again and again and again and repeat the very freaking same message because there will always be new consumers who haven't heard about stop wasting food, who need the guidance. So 
perhaps the focus on food waste will continue, but it will also be more targeted and, and uh, it should be clever communication also. So for those of you just joining us, we're having a, a panel discussion with some of the big driving forces in the world now uh, in reducing uh, food waste. And I have uh, the next question for Hillian Williams. Could you just say a few words on uh, who you are and what you represent? Uh, I'm Helen Williams. I work as a researcher for packaging and food waste at Karlstad University here in Sweden. Mm. Yeah. So Helene, uh, this is now a, a dream question of course, but is it possible to eliminate all food waste in the world? The simple <laughs> answer would I think be no. I think it's no, it's impossible to eliminate everything because things are going on out there and you will have accidents and things like that. So no, we will never reach 100% elimination. So what kind of a number are we talking about? What is possible? Right, so I, I, I don't dare actually to, to give a prognosis like that. I'm, I'm a researcher and I try to look at the figures and I haven't studied that, the possibilities. We have made some studies about uh, consumer households and their uh, interaction with packaging. And we saw in that study that uh, packaging could cause about 25% of the food waste that the households have. And I, I think it's even bigger because the household don't realize all the effects that packaging might have. So at least, I mean, to, to reduce it by 25, 30 and up to 50%, that, that is in, I mean, in a, in a reachable goals, definitely. Yeah, uh, Stefan, do we want to fill in there? I just want to add and point out again to the examples I have given here. Yeah, most of them are in the range of 30 to 50 percent mm -hmm. for a case study. There are no calculations out for the whole food waste around the globe. But if you look in the example of Kenya, where we will have 46 percent reduction, uh, if you look to the bread example, which was also in the range of 50, um, I will follow the, the very vague estimate of Helen to say that is, the, that is in the first round achievable. Yeah. Yes, do you want to fill in there, Robert? Fun well, uh, we recently had the, um, uh, the UN, I say, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot the name of that meeting of the <laughs> United Nations, but they established uh, the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, and actually goal number 12.3 clearly states that the objective is to reduce food waste by that time by 50%, to halve it uh, from now on. That wow. was considered as feasible. 2030. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. And, and just to add, um, I think that is a reasonable goal for food wastage, but there's a difference between food loss and food waste. And so the loss mostly happening in the developing world through to due to lack of technology or infrastructure. And I think we could do better than 50% there in terms of reducing the amount of food loss. It will take an investment and some effort but uh, I think there's great potential there. And as opposed to waste, where 50% does seem like a doable goal and it's going to take individuals and companies alike to paying attention to the issue, uh, putting in that effort more than the investment. Mm -hmm. So let's say that your prognosis uh, more than 50%. Uh, what would then happen to the farmers and the industry uh, if the uh, consumers stop wasting food? Actually, this question uh, is directed it to Robert. Sounds like a uh, Robert question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, well, I'm not an economist. Uh, let's talk about food waste in industrialized countries. What will happen if that is going to be significantly reduced? Um, that means that the uh, uh, demand for food production by farmers will reduce. And I think econ economic laws then say that the price will go down. So this sound not good for farmers in the first instance on the short term. However, um, we should look at it in the, in the whole food system context. And uh, it is obvious that if uh, this, this wastage is going to be reduced and the whole food system, the food uh, production, distribution and supply is going to be more efficient with a less waste of uh, natural resources. Uh, that means that uh, everybody who is part of that system, that economic system, is going to benefit. 
take for instance uh, if farmers um, can produce less tomatoes for instance because the market has reduced mm. because the consumers waste less that means that farmers have land over which they can use for other remunerative crops uh, and so it is not uh, going to be that uh, uh, they are just sitting down with uh, desperate to say oh we have lost our tomato market for 10 percent no farmers if they were if they are good farmers and entrepreneurs and they are they will use that opportunity of the land they have available to produce other uh, remunerative uh, products and therefore i think it will be in the interest for everybody including the farmers if uh, food waste can be reduced Yes, we have a comment from Stefan first, then yes, Selina. I, I cut out uh, that slide from my presentation um, this morning, but you should not forget about the population growth. And um, I don't have the figures in mind correctly, but it's something like in, 20, in 2050, we need more or less the double amount of food to, to feed the population of the globe. And half of that could come from reducing food waste by 50%. So if you set that into perspective of the growth of population, I don't see the farmers producing less, mm. but I see them producing something which is eaten, which I would think is the purpose. <laughs> good question, good answer, thank you. Selina. Very, very good point. I'm going to write it down because I'm going to be in some panel debates where we're going to discuss that, oh no, people started, uh, stopped wasting food, now the uh, farmers will go bankrupt. So this is a very good point. Um, I will add up to you and you that um, good business case, uh, hospitals and uh, canteens in Denmark, food waste, really reducing food waste. And now when they reduce food waste, they suddenly get more money because the money, are s uh, they're saved. For those money, they are starting to buy organic food. So which is good because, you know, more organic food, more growth for the organic farmers. So reducing food waste can actually give the opportunity to new food uh, markets in a way, organic food. So, so it's, it's not a bad thing. You can keep uh, holding that microphone, Selena, because I have a question directed to you. Uh, what is more important in the fight against food waste? Is it prevention or symptom treatment? Oh, good question. Well, uh, I would say both uh, because, uh, as Jonathan already mentioned, there will always be some food that is wasted. Uh, and it's good to give the food to, for example, charities or if cannot charities, then biogas, uh, compost. Uh, but I also think that the prevention is, is, is very, very uh, important too. I also, uh, what I also see on many levels in Europe, that there are a lot of projects, a lot of events, a lot of organizations uh, focusing on the symptom treatment. And of course, you know, if they have a campaign or an event with some bendy fruits and vegetables, it's good. Uh, but still, it is a symptom treatment you also need to address the prevention. And it's not that hot as a simple treatment because, you know, uh, the press clips, the amount of press coverage we get um, when we're giving po food to homeless people is much, much more than if the amount of press coverage we get when we are uh, teaming up with, for example, a researcher uh, and doing some studies on, sim uh, on the prevention. The press, they were like, they don't care about the prevention, but they care about the homeless people. And it's a good stories, you know, good pictures, but it's important. Prevention is very important, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, yeah. Helene? Uh, I, I can agree with Selena. It's, it's not easy to get the, the articles about that, but of course, from a sustainability perspective and what we're heading for, the prevention is extremely important, mm. extremely. Yeah, I would, I would add we need to certainly focus on reducing the amount of waste that's happening. And in many cases, just to harken back to the, the previous question, we can try to, to grow less in a certain place. Uh, and the savings from reducing the amount of resources that go into producing those food is also important. Uh, so the, the financial savings, but also the environmental impact and not continuing to grow and grow and grow when you don't have a market and and there's just a, a little more need for finer calibration on supply and demand hmm. i can only underline what helen said i think the, the top priority is prevention 
It can't be the job to produce food waste to feed poor people. It must be prevention, make the food system efficient, and the objective must be to give the poor people real food, not coming from food waste, through employment, through other tools. But to say a target, um, produce food waste so that you can do the charity, I think is the wrong objective. But what, uh, whenever you have food waste, you should do it. Mm. Okay, so uh, any comments on that? No? Okay, yeah? yeah well, just to add a, a bit about media coverage, I would advise against trying to follow certain policies just because it might be the sexier topic and because it might get more media play and, and instead focus on the more lasting changes. And uh, for example, in the United States, what seems to get a lot of attention is dumpster diving or, or eating food that's been thrown away. And that's the ultimate symptom treatment. Mm. And, uh, and we really need to focus much earlier on the prevention side of things. Mm. And, and certainly no person should have to be eating from a dumpster, whether it's for effect or, or impact or just through sheer need. A lot of dumpster divers in Denmark, they have like, but we are rescuing food. But it's like, uh, the food is already thrown away. At, you don't really know they're like bacteria and the food is bad. You do not know it. So no, you're not rescuing the food. Right now we have a new tendency in Denmark, the dumpster divers cafes and restaurants. Uh, what do you think about that? What's your take? Because uh, that's pretty tricky. Yeah, uh, I haven't been to one yet. Um, I would be curious to see how it works, but I think that is very low on the list of, of needed attention and investment. And instead, there are some cafes that are, are serving food that's been saved but hasn't been actually taken from the dumpster. And, and certainly, we want to take into account food safety issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert Van Otterdijk. Yeah, I, I just want to make a small remark to make sure that there is absolutely no misunderstanding here on the symptom treatment of uh, um, <coughs> sending food to uh, charities, food banks, and, and, and uh, poor homeless people. Uh, no, nobody is going to send wasted food or food waste to these people. We send food there which is at risk to get wasted. Uh, so uh, we have to be very careful in uh, the way that we uh, express ourselves. There is no food waste going to homeless or poor people. There is good food absolutely good quality, healthy, nutritious mm. to these people, which food otherwise mm. is at risk to get wasted. Yeah, yeah I, I love that point and it, it speaks to the semantics of the issue and, and I try to use wasted food wherever possible instead of food waste because food waste connotes that, that this is trash and for the most part wasted food is a lost opportunity. Mm. It's, it's food that could have been eaten but through a decision at some point in the food chain was not eaten. All right, uh, so what's going on in France right now? Uh, is it then a good idea to introduce a ban on uh, food waste like uh, they suppose in, in France? Yes or no? Robert? Uh, I think if this uh, really can be achieved, uh, this is an, uh, probably a great breakthrough that at political level, by a legislative level, this is going to be uh, approved and introduced and promoted. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we all want to fight for and uh, this is one of the big obstacles that anybody who is trying to reduce food waste comes across. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, of course from political and legislative level, understandably, um, people are extremely hesitant to approve that because if something goes wrong, if any food poisoning occurs, then they are going to be nailed down. But the same thing happens with in the normal supermarket if you buy food there. But ca something can go wrong. You can always, it happens actually regularly in our modern food systems that you buy from the supermarket food which is by far not expired and still you get sick and you have a small scandal and so. So if we can, uh, if France can be the, the breakthrough and then other countries can follow at European level to allow this and to make the, the laws to allow uh, don food donations, make those laws more flexible, that would be, would be fantastic.
Yeah. I want to actually, uh, bef yeah. before we pass it on to, to Jonathan, uh, yes, Helene? Yeah, a, a comment to that. Uh, what is also very important for the future is that uh, we need a, a higher degree of collaborations among actors within the supply chain, but we also need the support from government. I mean, what they can do with different types of legislation or taking away some legislation that is a problem for, mm. for handling these issues in a, in a good way. So these systems, or if it's dif different systems, or if it's the same, I mean, we have to work together mm. to, make it, to make the best possible solutions for the future. Mm. So the topic now is, uh, is it a good idea to introduce a ban on food? Uh, and uh, I was wondering, is this even possible in the States, Jonathan? Uh, issuing a ban on landfilling food is certainly possible. There are several states that are already doing so. Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. And uh, for me, attacking that, that end of the food chain, making it impossible or illegal to throw away food would have a dramatic impact back through other parts of the food chain and, and change how we think about food and interact with it and certainly how we purchase it. And to me, that is the, the lasting solution, the one policy lever that, that would really make sense in the United States and, and most likely throughout the developed world. Mm -hmm. So, Stefan Lim. I would fully support a, land, uh, a landfill ban for food waste as we also support in Europe a landfill ban for packaging, because this incre increases the pressure to make something useful at the end of the life cycle of food or of packaging. I don't believe in bans which you cannot really implement. I would believe in targets like the UN target to say we are want to reduce, which gives guidance and gives incentives and gives uh, leadership. By the way, the European Union is also discussing for the first time a food waste reduction target in their circular economy package. We haven't seen that before as well. Mm -hmm. I think this is the right way to go. And I'm a little bit more s critical on um, using this food as good as it is at the end um, for specific purposes. I mean, it might be a little bit provocative, but one of the green dark think tanks in Europe one day said, why is the life, average lifetime of all of us increasing? Mm. The answer is hygienic, hygiene. It's the hygiene in water, and the hygiene in sewage, the hygiene in medicine, the hygiene in food, ensured by packaging. And now we say we accept at a given stand that there is less hygiene for a given food. I have problems to fully go down this way. Yeah? Robert, come on. Um, banning uh, penalties and so uh, is uh, often not the best solution, especially not if it uh, is not accompanied with alternatives and facilitate the industry and the retail to alternatives. For instance, there are so many laws. At the moment, food donations is forbidden in many cases. It's even often, I think in the Netherlands, is officially not allowed to send uh, uh, food uh, to, to animal feed. So if you don't allow them to do anything with it, then what do you expect? Huh? Uh, the, they have to go with it somewhere. And, and therefore, uh, a ban like that on, uh, on, um, on landfill uh, can only work if uh, alternatives are uh, well provided to the, to the industry. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're asking for more problems only. Just to push back on that a tiny bit, uh, I think that setting that kind of ban will jumpstart the private industry to find solutions in addition to hopefully finding policy solutions and, and making it legal to donate food in the Netherlands, for example. And, and hopefully that kind of policy change will, will prompt others and, and can lead to, to more action. But something has to be done because at, at present there's a real impasse and and we have this real jammed food system and the coexistence of hunger and waste. And so we have to change something. Selina. In Denmark, we are right now in the group for the Danish Ministry for the Food and Environment. And we are right now uh, sitting a lot of stakeholders, NGOs, uh, food producers, Arla, Danish supermarket, Coop, uh, 
and looking at those legislations and uh, perhaps you know to to make it easier to donate food to surplus uh, surplus food to charities mm. now the thing in denmark if this law will be introduced in denmark i mean i love irish's work he's amazing but the thing right now is the the law has to be flexible because at the moment we have 6000 homeless people in denmark the food waste in Danish supermarkets is 163 tons a year. All that food, surplus food, you know, it cannot go to 6,000 people. They will get very fat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the charities, we do not have enough charities to, to take all the food. Mm. Now onto the biogas. The, we do not also have the infrastructure for the biogas plants as well yet. Mm. So if that law is implemented in Denmark, there has to be additional laws mm. who will, you know, take those infrastructures very seriously with the you know helping organizations to give food to surp uh, surplus food to charities and biogas as well otherwise you know the charities will drown in food waste and uh, the food waste will be pushed into a new level and there's still food waste mm. that was actually my question uh, can the charity organizations take care of all this food if this law uh, comes about yeah. yeah but we are back that prevention is first yeah, we have to prevent the food waste first, and the leftover we have to use useful for charity if it's just the expiry date and it's still good. Mm. But also for animal food, there are reasons why that has been forbidden. In the old days, all the pigs on the farm got the old food. But think about um, what was it, BSE or whatever. Yeah, so there was a hygienic reasons to reduce that impact going back into the into the animal um, nutrition chain. Yeah? Mm. So I think we have to be very, very careful. There is not one solution. Mm. We need flexibility, but prevention is first. Yes. OK, so I have a final question. And uh, before I ask this, uh, I w I'm wondering if there's anybody in the audience who has one question for these guys. So I just ask my question and just think about it. Maybe you have one or two questions, if that's OK with you guys. So my final question is uh, regarding Denmark. Uh, how was Denmark uh, able to reduce food waste with 25%? How was that done? Haven't you seen my presentation? <laughs> yes, but maybe <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it mostly is the, the what uh, consumers uh, have been doing. So it is the power of consumers, basically. Mm. They, they were the main uh, driver to reduce the food waste uh, because the awareness through the media is actually been pushing the consumers to do something. Suddenly the consumers started using food waste. It is becoming trendy. Uh, supermarkets starting to sell food next to uh, past to expiry date. Uh, canteens and restaurants start to focus on food waste. And, and you know, it is a ball that is gets rolling. But again, it starts with ourselves. It starts with the consumers. We have enormous power to change this. All right, so we have a, a question from the audience, and uh, please state your name and where you're coming from, and your question, please. My name is Bjorn Pettersson. I work with barrier polymers. Hi, barrier polymers. Um, the last answer gave a little bit of answer to my question as well, on what's happening in Denmark, because I, th I think there's one elephant in the room, and, and that is the fact that unless you get the um, retailers and the food industry on the boat, you, you're not going to achieve very much because it's a, in their DNA to sell more and pay less for packaging. So uh, you Im influence the politicians, you influence the consumers, uh, but how do you get uh, the, the industry, the, the last part of the supply chain on the boat? That's, that's really, a, a th I think, the big question. Selena? Well, the uh, first consumers and we pushed the consumers they started the hype then we were contacted by the minister for environment then the former government and this government started to focus on the problem and they invited the industry they invited the supermarkets so they were creating also this push for them to uh, stop wasting food to do something and in again invent new products invent you know start selling more, for example, organic food, because there's a demand for organic food because people waste less food now, they have more money, they can buy organic food, which is more expensive. So uh, again, it's like this ball that is rolling. But yes, you are right. I mean, the initial DNA <laughs> of the farmers, of the industry is uh, 
to sell more food and uh, so we can waste it, so we can buy more food. It is the initial uh, DNA, so uh, this mindset has to be changed. So maybe from more to better, instead of, you know, we can get more with less. Stefan? Um, somebody mentioned already here that we are sitting together with the reta retailers around the table to reduce the food waste problem. So they are already on board, they can't escape anymore. <laughs> Second question. Many of the examples I have given is reducing the waste rate in their shelves. By intelligent packaging, they reduce the cheese which they can't sell. Yeah? So I think you have different levels. They have an interest to re reduce the waste which is in their supply chain. What you are talking is how much they sell to the very end. Yeah? And there I am very much uh, with her saying then it's about the quality and improving the, the level of the food you are selling. That is pos probably the way out. Hmm. Helian Williams. Yeah. I, I also experienced now these last couple of years that more and more people realize what we are ahead of, what, what's in front of us with and what we need to do for sustainable development and with the transformation. We are not completely there yet to see the products on the market and the consumers asking for this. But I think as soon as we try to, 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 to I mean, to move this in, in front of us, you c could have and see rapid shifts in how consu because we saw for 10 years with the ecological food that people weren't asking for it, and now it's booming. I mean, it's an increase with 200% every half year almost. So if we provide solutions that are there and we talk about selling new solutions that help you to reduce waste, we could also see it's not there today, but it could be a, a, a mm. quick shift going from something that consumer considers that attractive to consider it as a hygiene factor for, for buying. Why should I buy this very big packaging when I only need half of it? I don't want to buy that big one. So, so it, could, it could change. And I think with the sustainable development change in mind, uh, I, I think we have exciting times in front of us in this regard. Uh, yeah, I would, I would echo that as well. Uh, things change very quickly in the food industry and where there's consumer demand, the, the industry meets that demand for the most part. So it's, it's somewhat a matter of consumers advocating for change and it's also a matter of retailers playing their part. And to me, I'm quite optimistic because what's also in retailers and the entire food industry's best interests in, in their DNA is increased profits. And so using a higher percentage of that food that you purchase, I mean, that makes total rational economic sense. And now that we're starting to see retailers pay attention to that, sell food longer, maybe even uh, a wider range of acceptable items, uh, to me that is something that will, will only take hold firmer and firmer as we increase in this food waste issue. Mm -hmm. And also, at the same time, as consumers push for change, then stores and restaurants can advocate what kinds of, of food waste reduction activities they're pursuing, and that's going to be something that consumers demand, as we see with recycling these days. Mm -hmm. So I think we have uh, time for one final question. No? All right, running over. <laughs> Thank you. State your name and where you're from, please. Thank you. My name's Des King. I'm a packaging journalist. Um, I was very struck by one statistic that came out, and it was in Stefan's uh, presentation, that 85% of US shoppers, I think, uh, perceive packaging to be potentially harmful. Yet he also wheeled out a lot of statistics that showed how uh, the differences between waste of fresh produce and packaged produce were heavily uh, in favor of packaged produce. However awful the food waste is in the world, isn't this a golden opportunity for the packaging industry to redress some of the perceptions that it has to confront on a daily basis? And why is it so bad at presenting its own image in a favorable light? Yes, comment? I guess it's a question to the packaging industry. 
And um, the answer is I'm here. Yes, we see a huge potential um, to demonstrate in a positive way the um, contribution this industry can play to help to reduce food waste. And um, we've talked about long shelf life, uh, which needs a specific, normally higher value packaging. We, spoke, we speak about portion packaging to make the right portions. So we think that there are opportunities out. And just to my statistics, the percentage wars that the consumer believes that packaging has a bigger impact than wasting food. It was not that 85% of consumers think packaging is bad. But if you ask them what has the higher impact on the environment to have packaging or wasting my food, they are telling you packaging. It's a little bit different story like uh, you said. Uh, we have uh, to a high extent used packaging to show uh, our unsustainable society, to show that there's a lot of wastage produced every day. And it, it, it's a good example because consumer meet packaging every day. That means that for the past 25 years, the industry itself, together with the consumers and the population, has thought about packaging as a waste. We have focused and talked about packaging when it's empty, when it is a waste. We have, for the past 20 years, not been talking about what packaging do for preventing food waste, for protection, for making it easier to use the product. And I mean, when you communicate like that for 20 years, it takes some time to, to turn that around and to see a broader picture and to change the way you communicate. And I've been, I mean, doing lectures for the past 20 years, almost about the role of packaging. Not, not 20 years, I mean 10 years. And uh, <laughs> the thing is that people lis listen and they say, yeah, you're right. And then they can turn to a colleague and start to, to discuss, yeah, but we have to reduce the, the amount of packaging material we are using. So it's so stuck in their heads, so it's difficult <laughs> to change it. Selena, comment. I totally echo you and you, <laughs> and you too. In Denmark, we, it's almost a movement starting. The packaging is evil. We have to have zero packaging. Uh, there's this uh, shop in, uh, oh, I think it's in Berlin, in Germany. The, the zero packaging shop, when you go with your own, you know, packaging and you, uh, well, it's not very hygienic, is it? But, but the thing is, the packaging industry, and I also told that in Interpack when we were there, uh, needs to communicate that, of course, we do not overpack things, but we need to uh, remind people that packaging does reduce food waste. And it's important to tell it over and over and over again, because at the moment, people think that the packaging is like the Darth Vader. It's on the industry, the evil empire. Just to make one maybe final comment, you shouldn't forget that uh, in 2011, the Safe Food Initiative was started by Messe Düsseldorf Interpack, representing the packaging process, uh, the food processing, uh, the packaging machine, uh, the packaging production um, industry. Why, why did they support that? Because oh, since 20 years, we were getting tired of always being the, the evil. Yeah? And then there was a new subject out where we could, for the first time, emotionally communicate the benefit packaging has. When I talked 20 years ago about functional barriers and the, the functional benefits of packaging, you know, nobody was listening to me. I was never asked to a podium. Since we talk about reducing food waste, more or less setting the same, the, the benefits of packaging and the advantages of hygienic and things like that, we are starting to be heard. So this is changing perspective. We hope, but it will take a generation, I'm sure. Okay then, so that concludes this uh, panel discussion. It's been really interesting hearing your answers. And uh, I want to thank you, Robert von Otterdirk and Selina Juhl. Is that uh, correctly pronounced? And uh, Helene uh, Williams, uh, on of course, uh, Jonathan Bloom and Stefan Glim. Thank you very much for joining us and coming from your countries, visiting us here in Sweden.